Good morning, everybody. It's wonderful to see you here all so early in the morning. Um, welcome to Arena Stage at the Mead Center for American Theater, Theater and the launch of the National Civil War Project. As you can see, the logo. <laughs> I'm Molly Smith, Artistic Director of Arena Stage, and I have to say it's a tremendous honor to embark on this project with all of these inspiring artists, artistic directors, university presen presidents, and scholars. This project commemorates the 150th anniversary of the American Civil War, which for many, most of us, is the most significant event in American history that continues to reverberate through the entire country today. This is a groundbreaking, what I would term radical collaboration between four universities and five performing arts organizations spanning four geographies and at least two years time. There are many questions we'll be surfacing over the next few years through at least 2015, and my guess is it might go on further than that. How did reconstruction and its aftermath shape who we are today? What is our continuing obsession in America around states' rights and civil rights, and how do they play out nationally and within each of our regions? How do each of our areas of the country continue to reverberate because of their special place in the American Civil War? What lessons have we learned from the Civil War, and what lessons haven't we learned? By the end of this project, we'll have a significant body of Civil War plays and projects. These projects will be informed by the scholars we're working with and will be richer because of the intersection between scholars and artists. Washington, D.C. was the heartbeat of the American Civil War in many ways, with Lincoln in the White House looking over our shoulder at Arlington Cemetery, Robert Lee's home. And this war transformed D.C. from a semi-rural city into an urban center of national importance. Just walk through our city. Fort Stevens, Ford's Theater, Lincoln's Cottage, Battleground National Cemetery, the Surratt Boarding House, which is in Chinatown, Arlington House, Robert E. Lee Memorial, Abraham Lincoln, Clara Barton, Walt Whitman, Frederick Douglass, all called this home. Partnering with Arena Stage to explore the Civil War through the lens of Washington, D.C. is the vibrant GW University. And I must say, it has been a real thrill for us at Arena Stage to partner with GW, uh, a fantastic university led by Dr. Stephen Knapp. It's a theater piece. It's a theater piece. We will hear Dr. Stephen Knapp. Uh, but first of all, the person uh, who is uh, sitting next to me and uh, who uh, has been alongside uh, everything having to do with this project, indeed the project was inspired by noted choreographer Liz Lerman, whose work has redefined dance and whose genius mind continues to challenge norms, engage communities, and impact artists and audiences globally. So thrilled to introduce Liz, to you. Thank you. Thanks. I have many thank yous. I want to thank Arena Stage, Molly, David, just an incredible staff making so many things possible for me, which I'm going to tell you about in a moment. I want to thank ART and Harvard University, who housed me at the very, very beginning of this. And um, amazing. I'm going to tell you a little bit about that as well. And I want to thank George Washington University. And I get to introduce the president. So I'm going to do that in a minute, too. <laughs> uh, but I want to just start with this notion of what's an idea. Because it's lovely. I've been credited with an idea. But an idea is nothing if it doesn't catch hold. It's just nothing. And it's not actually my idea. It's an idea that was there for the taking. It's arguable, perhaps genius is an individual thing, I don't know, but I know that genius flowers when people come together. It flowers in generosity, it flowers in difference. It flowers when we make the kinds of distinctions we're beginning to make as we look at these things. It flowers when institutions come together, sometimes hard, sometimes soft. And that is really the underpinning of this project. Giving us a chance to cross over in so many ways 
It may sound small, but dance and theater doesn't spend enough time together in this country. It may sound small, but the universities and these uh, uh, theaters, they, they're in the same city, they don't get to spend time in each other's worlds enough. Uh, and I think, uh, for me, the, the possibility that artists and scholars can come together to make evident the enormity of our contemporary life by looking at this moment in history. I don't know where in our lives people get to work things out. If you watch the same show for the news every day, and you watch the same this and the same, you read this, when do people get to come together and think and feel in the same space? I think it's our theaters. I think it's our performing arts. And I think, I hope that that's what this project will allow to happen. Um, I know it will. <clears throat> um, lastly, I just because uh, I left an institution a year and a half ago, uh, it is remarkable to me to be back inside them. And uh, I feel this sense of urgency on the part of the people you're going to hear from, that of making, you know, we talk a lot about citizenship, but I think we're really talking about citizen institutions. And I think that's, again, what we're going to, the, 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 the making of that or the remaking of that is part of what will happen. Um, for myself, I got interested in some big questions and some small questions. I'm going to just tell you a little bit about that project called Healing Wars. Initially, some of the questions I came up, uh, I was musing about was why does medicine innovate in wartime, which it does. Uh, what happens to people who are healers in the, in the context of war? Um, what do we do about the nature of violence, both as a healing force, uh, which it is in the middle of battle, and uh, who's going to absorb all this when it's over? What is the aftermath? And I think many of our projects will probably help us come to understand that as we live right now in the aftermath of what's been happening the last decade. Um, so I'm going to just give you a little hint by showing you some of the research. And this is very, very raw data you're going to see. And um, don't, I don't try to make too much sense out of it, but maybe just take a look. I'm starting with, this was at Harvard. We got to, amazing, we got to go into the library, and the librarians brought up from the basement these incredible drawings. And what I loved was that the librarians got excited because the videographer was moving them around and taking pictures. It was a wonderful day. Um, also at Harvard, we... Uh, spent time reading Jufau's book, which is incredible, and began to develop some <clears throat> characters from that, including somebody kind of based loosely on Clara Barton. And it led us to want to do some other research, so we spent time, this is Tamara Pullman, uh, at Antietam, and uh, trying to just embody, in a way, what it feels like to be there. Now, it matters to me who I'm working with, because when I do a piece like this, the artists, <clears throat> they don't just research uh, in the library. They don't just read. They have to research themselves. She's a mom. She's got two boys. Uh, this is the bridge at Antietam. She's also married to the film actor Bill Pullman, who um, it turns out they hadn't been in a piece together for since graduate school. So I wanted, I wanted this sense of, um, of love, actually, in the piece. And uh, how, so he plays a surgeon that uh, moves between the Iraq War and the Civil War. And uh, in a minute, you're going to see a little bit of that. So <clears throat> we went, the three of us, to western New York State, where he's from, and uh, went to a reenactment. And they were thrilled to have Bill in the reenactment. They, they dressed him up and dressed Tamara up. And, uh, but in, the part you're going to see is a, a surgeon, because we really wanted to learn from the surgeon. This surgeon actually was the surgeon to Bill's father as he was dying. He is an incredible Civil War scholar, and he begins to tell a story which you'll hear Bill finish in just a small clip from a work in progress that we were doing. So that's a, a reenactment surgery. I just want you to see Bill. Yeah. He's really in his role. They're in the same town. Unlike modern armies. And deliberately, the modern army doesn't do that. And I'll tell you why. The men from the 1st Minnesota and the 2nd July wiped out most of the generation yeah, right. of that county from back home in Minnesota. They lost their young men that afternoon. The 1st Minnesota Regiment left the western part of that state in 1861 with about a thousand men. And for each man, young man that left, they left a family behind. They always left a mother behind to wait. Now what would happen in battle? There was a phenomenon that's called never wavering. 
these, each company would form a line and each, where each man would be standing next to his uncle and then three men down was his neighbor and this, on the other side of that was his father. When a charge was commanded, the line would move forward made up of companies of men who knew each other intimately. You all face this withering fire and yet you couldn't fall down and burrow in and you couldn't retreat because you were surrounded by men who assumed you wouldn't. And if you did, you knew you couldn't go home again. So that's a, a small little part of something that we're working on and it will be premiering here in this very beautiful theater next year. Um, so now I get to introduce somebody fantastic. I'm actually, I have a master's degree from George Washington University. The school nurtured me through an incredibly complicated, difficult time in my life and really challenged me. It's also where I began, speaking of leaving institutions, working with all the old people and developing that. It's while I was there. So it's no surprise to me and in fact kind of a wonderment that uh, President Stephen Knapp uh, so completely understood this idea when he and Molly met. They had a brief meeting, and uh, it's like, it ex the, again, that idea of genius, it sparked, and they had together, the two of them, a vision of what this could become, and uh, without him, we would not be here, because he really came forward in so many ways, along with the wonderful Barbara Porter, who works with him. There he comes. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Liz, for those very generous uh, comments. and. Uh, the reality of uh, citizens, uh, citizen institutions is something we really are embracing and engaging, and I think we're going to live into that as this project moves forward. I also want to thank Molly for what is already just a, a wonderful partnership, which is only, only going to continue to blossom. And Liz, you really did plant the seed, I have to say, so I hope uh, uh, we're never going to forget that. Well, I'm delighted to join my artistic and academic colleagues for today's official launch of the National Civil War Project, and I'd like to acknowledge uh, some of the audience, Peg Barrett, the Dean of the Columbian College of Arts and Sciences, uh, and also the members of the George Washington University faculty who are here with us today. We're launching this unique and I believe unprecedented project midway through our nation's commemoration of the 150th anniversary of its bloodiest but also its most transformative war. We're truly honored and delighted to be working with Molly Smith and our partners at Arena Stage on our portion of the project. Uh, thanks to Liz Lerman for her, her key role in initiating this project and for the workshop she's already conducted with students on our campus. Uh, we're already deeply engaged in the project, although we're launching it today. She's already been holding those workshops. And I'm, uh, as she's mentioned, I'm happy to note that uh, Liz is a, an alumna of George Washington. Uh, and in fact, she will be an artist in residence at George Washington while she develops the first of the plays that will emerge from the Arena Stage GW partnership, Healing Wars. I'm also delighted that we have uh, other prestigious institutions and arts organizations that have joined us in this effort. And this national project will not only produce groundbreaking theatrical works, but will enliven the study of history and many other fields with the vitality, immediacy, and vibrancy of theater. It will engage the expertise of scholars in enriching the content of the plays themselves, and at the same time, by involving students in the excitement of this exchange of ideas and energies it will help to build a future audience that will ensure the future sustainability of theater, which is so important to the cultural health of our nation. George Washington's faculty has rallied behind the idea and plans to hold lectures, symposia, and seminars that will extend the academic impact of the productions themselves. At the same time, students will have the opportunity to work as interns with the professional theater companies in all our cities, and also to produce their own original works, in our case on related themes, we envision 10 new students, uh, new student plays at George Washington in addition to the three professional works produced by Arena Stage. Each student playwright will work alongside another student specializing in an academic field such as history, nursing, sociology, and many others. Student writers will be contributing also to one of the commissioned professional pieces, Our War. This project will serve, we hope, as a national model for similar collaborations in the future at other universities and in other cities across the nation besides the initial four cities. To make that easier, we will be carefully documenting this whole process. And now, I'd like to introduce Professor Leslie Jacobson, who will go into this greater detail about George Washington's academic offerings.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, President Knapp. Uh, GW is particularly uh, excited about exploring the ways that scholars and artists can cross-pollinate and inspire the creation of performances that illuminate issues as complex and multifaceted as civil war. Starting in the summer of 2011, a core of five faculty began meeting to develop university programming around this project. This group has now expanded to include 15 faculty members from 10 programs and departments at GW found principally in the Columbian College of Arts and Sciences. We meet monthly to plan a variety of curricular and artistic experiences and opportunities for our students, faculty, and the wider DC community. Some of these initiatives are featuring course offerings that already exist in our departments, which will focus on the Civil War, and creating a set of interdisciplinary courses, especially for this project, which will uh, link artistic expression with research focused on the American Civil War, or the concept of Civil War more globally. We hope to promote these courses over the next two years. Secondly, the university itself will launch this event on April 1st we're with a program called Acting and Reenacting, a Civil War performance collage and conversation. Bringing artists, Civil War reenactors from around DC and scholars together around the topic of embodying history, this event is open to the university community and beyond. It's designed to focus on some of the intellectual and artistic opportunities that this Civil War project in partnership with Arena Stage, will afford our students and our faculty. Thirdly, we have developed a process by which students can apply for and be selected to create interdisciplinary performance work on themes of civil war to be produced next year and the year after. There will be five commissions awarded each year. In addition, two student playwrights will have the privilege of participating in the Arena Stage Our War project. Thank you, Molly. We're very, very excited about this. Finally, we are developing a list of artists and scholars to invite to campus for a speaker series and workshops. Already this year, as President Knapp mentioned, Liz Lerman has come to campus to work with students in a short residency, and she will be with us for a longer residency next year, we're extremely happy to say. Uh, I, together, we hope that all of these initiatives taken as a whole will enrich our understanding of civil war in both the local community and the national community and dialogue. Thank you very much. Just on a personal note, a little bit of uh, history. Liz and I met 35 years ago here in Washington, D.C. when she was first creating her theater piece uh, with older people. And Leslie and I met 30 years ago uh, when she was the head of the Washington Area Feminist Theater where I directed my first professional production. So there's a beauty to the theater and to, we, we believe, these university partnerships that we will be going through life together and looking at the long view. I'd like to do a special thanks uh, to David Snyder, who's been incredible uh, producing this, our press at Arena, Edgar Doby, our executive director, and the staff at Arena Stage. Uh, it's been really terrific. This has been a journey that's been already almost two years in the making. Uh, even though we're all getting together on one stage in uh, one moment, uh, there has been uh, much that's been delved into already. In addition to Liz Lerman's Healing Wars, which will be uh, produced in this theater space, uh, Nina Seavey, who is a brilliant uh, documentary filmmaker with GW, an Oscar winner, uh, will be documenting Liz's project uh, for um, uh, presenting, producing through PBS. We're very excited about that. Arena is also, uh, because we've been inspired by Kwame Kwe Arma, uh, project, uh, My America, we are embarking on a national commissioning of 25 playwrights, which will include, as Leslie said, two GW students entitled Our War, uh, to give a multiplicity of voices uh, to the Civil War, past, present, and future. 
uh, and this will be made into a theater piece, which then has the possibility to be able to t tour either through parts or wholly. And our first tour, of course, after this, will be over to GW. Uh, we are also commissioning the award-winning playwright and performer Daniel Beatty to create a play playing characters from slaves to generals to abolitionists to soldiers to those who went to war, those who were left behind, all played by one man. Talk about a multiplicity of voices. With song, poetry, and personal narrative exploring the depth and breadth of humanity involved in the American Civil War. So to have a master performer like Daniel Beatty express these stories within and through his own body will manifest for audiences how the Civil War continues to live within each one of us. Atlanta. Atlanta was a center for military operations and a su supply route for the Confederate Army during the Civil War and became a target for the Union Army. The fall of Atlanta in September of 1864 was a critical turning point in the Civil War, giving the North more confidence and leading to the re-election of President Abraham Lincoln in November of that year and the eventual surrender of the Confederacy. This story of reconstruction in Atlanta and Georgia gives us much to examine about how a city and a state can rebuild and heal after a war. Looking at the Civil War through the lens of Atlanta is the remarkable Alliance Theater and the vibrant Emory College Center for Creativity and Arts at Emory University. I'm so pleased to uh, introduce my dear friend, Susan Booth, Artistic Director of the Alliance, to share more about the work in Atlanta. Well, all right. So, uh, it's interesting to me, the fall of Atlanta, the reconstruction. As an Atlantan, I, I think about those terms with INGs because uh, Atlanta is falling, Atlanta is reconstructing as a daily part of its DNA. And the opportunity to lean into that and investigate this by dint of this project is tremendous. As the flagship theater of an American city singularly defined by its historic and contemporary dance with the struggle that was the Civil War and the struggle that is the ongoing fight for civil and human rights, the Alliance enters this project mindful that the past is not just prologue but currently present and daily pervasive. To that end, we are undertaking projects that are structurally founded on the intersection of then and now. Beginning in the summer, our Collision Project. This is a, a nationally unique teen initiative in which a resident ensemble of teenagers spend three weeks colliding with an iconic text, examining it, inhabiting it, ripping apart, and ultimately making it wholly their own. Our Collision Project this summer will tackle the Gettysburg Address. Their guide in this deconstruction and reconstruction will be the New York Times bestselling author and playwright Pearl Clegg. With our colleague theaters undertaking the same process concurrently in their respective cities, we look forward to the opportunity to bring these teen ensembles together here in our capital to perform for one another and for us, teaching us the contemporary resonances of that landmark document. Next up for the Alliance is an opportunity to work with one of our nation's most elegant and elegiac historians. Beginning with developmental workshops with Emory University in January of 2014, the Alliance will be working with the United States Poet Laureate Natasha Trethewey to bring her Pulitzer Prize winning poem cycle Native Guard to the stage for premiere at the Alliance in the 2014-2015 season. Trethewey's exquisite intersection of the Deep South's first black regiments being called into the Civil War and her own deeply woven contradictions is a landmark dialogue between personal narrative and national history. The Alliance is humbled and honored by the opportunity to dive into this national conversation with our theatrical and academic colleagues, both in Atlanta and across the country. I'd like to introduce to you from Emory University in Atlanta, our partner institution for this collaboration, Leslie Taylor, the Executive Director for Emory Center for Creativity and the Arts, and Lisa Paulson, Director of the Playwright Center at Emory University. Good 
after, good morning. Um, the Emory Center for Creativity and Arts is proud to be the linking partner with the Alliance Theater and the rest of the institutions and universities on this project and this timely and necessary exploration of the Civil War and its continuing aftermath in our society. The center will serve as a connector and an instigator of projects on campus that will complement and expand on the Alliance's programming. We will be working with the Emory Library's Marble, um, Marble, which stands for the Manuscript Archives and Rare Books Collection, whose rich holdings in African American literature and culture include the Langmuir African American Photography Collection, the papers of Alice uh, Walker, and the papers of the Southern Christian Leadership Coalition Conference, which are actually currently on exhibition in Emory's Shatton Gallery. We will also promote artistic partnerships with Emory's James Weldon Institute and the Emory Ethics Center and the departments of history, political science, African American studies, as well as all of the creative and performing arts departments on campus. The center will take some of its, a proportion of its annual project grant funds and target them towards faculty, students, and staff proposals that would be involving looking at this theme of the Civil War. Uh, lastly, we will be involved with the work of Lisa Paulson and the Theater Emory's Playwriting Center, which Lisa will tell you about now. Thanks, Leslie. Hi. Well, of course, <clears throat> the history of the Civil War lives on in all of us as Americans. And at Emory University, which was founded in Georgia in 1836, we are particularly and sometimes painfully aware of the complexity and contradictions of our own ongoing relationship to this history. The Civil War and emancipation are deeply entwined in our personal and collective actions, words, and aspirations. And so, at the Playwriting Center of Theater Emory, we are proud to commit ourselves to the Civil War project and to seek ways for theater to grasp and express this fundamental and perplexing piece of being an American in the 21st century. As Susan has described, in the coming year we will be working with the Alliance Theater and our Emory colleague, Natasha Trethway, on a stage adaptation of Native, Native Guard, including a developmental workshop. We will also undertake collaborative projects between regional playwrights and our students. Currently, we are in discussion with Jasper Watts on his Sapelo project, based on oral histories gathered in his home community on Sapelo Island, Georgia. His people are the Saltwater Geechee. The Geechee, or Gula, slaves were among the first freed in the South and currently face the possibility of losing the land they have owned since emancipation. I'm pleased to introduce actress January Lavoie, who is based in New York and working nationally in the country's leading regional theaters. This morning, January, will be reading from two segments of Natasha Trethway's Native Guard. Thank you. Pilgrimage, Vicksburg, Mississippi, and Southern History. Here, the Mississippi carved its mud-dark path, a graveyard for skeletons of sunken riverboats. Here, the river changed its course, turning away from the city as one turns forgetting from the past. The abandoned bluffs land sloping up above the river's bend, where now the Yazoo fills the Mississippi's empty bed. Here, the dead stand up in stone, white marble on Confederate Avenue. I stand on ground once hollowed by a web of caves. They must have seemed like catacombs in 1863 to the woman sitting in her parlor, candlelit, underground. I can see her listening to shells explode, writing herself into history, asking, what is to become of all the living things in this place? This whole city is a grave. Every spring, pilgrimage, 
the living come to mingle with the dead, brush against their cold shoulders in the long hallways, listen all night to their silence and indifference, relive their dying on the green battlefield. At the museum, we marvel at their clothes, preserved under glass, so much smaller than our own, as if those who wore them were only children. We sleep in their beds, the old mansions hunkered on the bluffs, draped in flowers, funereal, a blur of petals against the river's gray. The brochure in my room calls this living history. The brass plate on the door reads, Prissy's room. A window frames the river's crawl toward the gulf. In my dream, the ghost of history lies down beside me, rolls over, pins me beneath a heavy arm. Before the war, they were happy, he said, quoting our textbook. This was senior year history class. The slaves were clothed, fed, and better off under a master's care. I watched the words blur on the page. No one raised a hand, disagreed, not even me. It was late. We still had reconstruction to cover before the test, and luckily, three hours of watching Gone with the Wind. History, the teacher said, of the Old South. A true account of how things were back then. <laughs> On screen, a slave stood big as life, big mouth, bucked eyes, our textbooks grinning proof. A lie my teacher guarded. Silent, so did I. Beautiful January, just beautiful. I want to also give a special thanks um, to Carla, uh, who has helped uh, form this whole uh, project from the perspective of Arena Stage. Thank you, Carla. She's our timekeeper today, too. Uh, Baltimore and the DC Corridor. The city of Baltimore in 1863 was a microcosm of the American Civil War. It was a house divided caring for tens of thousands of wounded from both sides of the Civil War. Confederate soldiers camped on the grounds of Maryland Agricultural College, the former name of the University of Maryland, and students served on both sides of the conflict. After the war, the city became a haven for displaced Southerners and Southern writers and a mecca for freed slaves. Examining the American Civil War through the lens of Baltimore, are the dynamic Clarice Smith Performing Arts Center at the University of Maryland and the ever provocative Center Stage. Please welcome Paul Brohan, Director of Artistic Initiatives at the Clarice Smith Performing Arts Center. Good morning. I wish to share my thank yous with Molly and our host, uh, President Stephen Knapp from George Washington University. And I wish to share a special thank you with long-term partner and imminent friend, Liz Lerman, um, who has been one of the primary partners with the Clarice Smith Performing Arts Center since our founding. On September 6th of 2013, the Clarice Smith Performing Arts Center at the University of Maryland will open um, our season uh, with a national symposium entitled Civil War, Civil Rights, the Well-Being of a Nation. That is in partnership with the School of Public Policy at the University of Maryland, led by Dean Donald Kettle, and in association with the School of Public Health on the campus of the University of Maryland, um, and specifically the Center for Health Equities, led by Director and Dr. Stephen Thomas. Specifically in this symposium, we will be examining how the Civil War was the genesis of a civil rights movement in this country, 
that has a long history and is both ongoing and has a future yet to achieve. Of a specific focus in this symposium will be an examination of the history and the status of health disparities in this country as both a mirror to the history of the civil rights movement since the Civil War and a snapshot of where we are in this country currently. And as Dr. Stephen Thomas shared with the planning committee, uh, a, an amazing fact that in the 21st century in this United States, it is still more likely that a white woman without a high school diploma will give birth to a healthy baby and raise that child to adulthood than it is for a black woman with a master's degree. In May of 2015, the Clarice Smith Center is commissioning a new work for the Kronos Quartet to be composed by the jazz trumpeter, musician, and composer Terence Blanchard with libretto and spoken word elements by the National Book Award winning poet Nikki Finney. This piece will be performed uh, at a national heritage site here in the state of Maryland um, and will be performed in conjunction with a 500 voice choir. When David Harrington, the artistic director and founder of Kronos Quartet and I were researching this project and beginning the conversations, I will share with you that a single image um, has become a touchstone for us in our examination of this project. Uh, and that image was a photograph of a single blooming flower amongst the bloodied, lifeless corpses on the battlefield at Antietam. And that process and that image is something that we return to as we talk with Terrence Blanchard, as we communicate with Nikki and, and create this work. I will share with you that the book ending of the two seasons of the Clarice Smith Center from 2013 to 15 is intentional and that we intend to give room within those two seasons to further examination of programming, creative dialogues, community engagement, and partnership with the other members that you see on the stage here today to find ways to keep this project alive and flexible uh, and that we will respond and incorporate some of those um, opportunities within those two seasons. I will also share with you that one of the most palpable and pleasant realities of this project so far for the Clarice Smith Center um, has been um, a joyous discovery of like-minded and soul-minded partners at the Center Stage Theater in Baltimore, and that the conversations we have had together um, have been invigorating, and it has been a real honor to discover the opportunities that we have together and the shared commitment we have to the state of Maryland, to our communities, and to examining issues of great social and cultural impact. It is now my pleasure to welcome Gavin Witt, the Associate Artistic Director of Center Stage Theater. Morning, everybody. Uh, we don't have a performance piece to present to you, but I do have a little performance art piece to uh, enlist you all in to start us off. I, I must ask you to engage your imaginations as I speak and picture before you a tall, handsome Afro-Caribbean uh, with a suave, London accent, uh, <laughs> our esteemed artistic director, Kwame Kwayama, who could not, unfortunately, join us. So I do my best to speak for him. Uh, you know, as we embark on our part of this ambitious project, uh, I have consistently been struck by a feature of it that recalls the conflict that we all feel uh, called to commemorate. And before you imagine anything too drastic, or violent, after all, Baltimore was the site of the first blood spilt in this war. Uh, it's, it's simply that I think we mirror in miniature uh, the struggle between national union and individual liberty that was at its heart. Uh, you see us as a national confederation here uh, of organizations trying to found one central vision, uh, but honoring, as you've already heard, the local specificity. So at center stage uh, in Baltimore, we're thrilled to be part of this visionary collective, the National Confederation that Molly and Liz and President Knapp have helped bring forth as the State Theater of Maryland in partnership with the Cleary Smith Performing Arts Center and our State University of Maryland. Uh, we also, though, hope to give equal sway to the particular part of the sum. Uh, collectively, center stage will be uh, the catalyst uh, through our recently inaugurated media wall 
for a technological union of far-flung members uh, through online conversations, live streaming, and various forms of new media. Uh, remembering that this was also a conflict over economics, industry, property, and ultimately global trade, Center Stage is going to be commissioning a leading English playwright, not Kwame, uh, to create a piece exploring the war from a British and international perspective from diplomatic chess games that formed uh, an important part of the backdrop to uh, very personal sagas. With the rest of our season announcement coming up on March 11th, we will note plans for the area premiere of a Civil War themed production uh, with accompanying outreach. So stay tuned for more on that. I'm gonna remain coy. Uh, but that, that engagement opportunity surrounding the production honors uh, what I think is a central injunction uh, of this project to teach and to learn and to inspire uh, further generations. So our Encounter Teen program will tackle aspects of the legacy of this rich topic and looks forward to partnership with the uh, engagement programs at the University of Maryland and as you heard, the leadership that Alliance has been uh, providing. Finally, of course, uh, Paul brilliantly outlined the culminating collaboration uh, led by Clary Smith's Performing Arts Center uh, that will examine the idea of Maryland at war with itself uh, through this extravagant and multi-arts uh, confederation uh, of, by, and for the people, we hope. So that's a look at what we have coming ahead. Thank you. Boston and Cambridge. The Commonwealth of Massachusetts played a significant role in national events prior to and during the American Civil War. Massachusetts dominated the early anti-slavery movement during the 1830s, motivating activists across the nation. This in turn increased secularism in the North and South, one of the factors that led to the war. Examining the Civil War through the lens of Boston is the adventurous American Repertory Theater and the historic Harvard University. Please welcome Diane Paulus, wonderful director and artistic director of ART. Thank you, Molly. And uh, th this is a dream come true, I think, for all of us participating in this project to be convened together here in Washington, D.C. for this press launch. Uh, one of my biggest priorities and focuses as the artistic director of the ART has been how to integrate an arts institution more fully into the cognitive life of a research university, in this case, Harvard. And it has proven to be a driving force in all our programming and our artistic uh, inquiry, how we can use the intellectual resource of the university to provoke artists to think about the creative process in a new way. And we've started already over the last year with the Civil War Project, bringing scholars and artists together around what we called roundtable discussions on several topics relating to the Civil War. The first was uh, instigated by Skip Gates and the Du Bois Institute. We did a roundtable on the topic of Uncle Tom's Cabin. Uh, little known fact, one of the most performed plays in world theater history in the 19th century America landscape. Our second round table was on the topic of medicine, war, and weaponry and brought uh, professors from the medical school and uh, the Warren Museum at Harvard together with artists to discuss uh, what Liz was talking about this odd contradiction of medical advance during wartime. Our last round table was just uh, last week, and it dealt with uh, how we remember the Civil War through Winsler Homer paintings, to the Gardner photographs, uh, to the uh, current living history of reenactments. And we gathered uh, authors, including uh, Tony Horowitz and scholars at Harvard around this issue of photograph and memory. Uh, what this has spurned for us is the commission of several new works already in progress. Uh, the first is a project about the Boston abolitionist movement, which will premiere uh, this spring at the ART, performed by our Graduate Institute students, our graduate acting students at the, at the theater. 
uh, the second project by Jim and Ruth Bauer, the team behind The Blue Flower, which was a piece we created at the ART several years ago, was inspired actually from a chapter in Drew Faust's book, This Republic of Suffering, that uh, describes the Ford Theater. And you may uh, not be aware that the Ford Theater became the repository of all the war documents after the Civil War. And in 1893, the building collapsed from the weight of all the war documents. So Jim and Ruth Bauer were caught by this image, highly poetic and powerful image, and are using it as the setting for their new musical called The War Department. Um, I think this collaboration has already spawned uh, cross-fertilization inspired by Susan Booth and her work in Atlanta on the Collision Project. We've replicated that project in Boston and have been teaching at, in the Boston Arts Academy a curriculum inspired by the model in Atlanta of taking high school students um, and putting them in a interaction with a historical text. In this case, we use the Emancipation Proclamation this year and we'll continue all summer uh, joining Susan with the Gettysburg Address and stimulating high school students in the Boston area to create their own plays and their own uh, imaginings of civil war and what it means to them today. Uh, and lastly, uh, we've had the great opportunity to commission a young Harvard graduate, Matt Coin, who you'll hear from in a moment, on a new opera that uh, he's composing based on Walt Whitman's memoranda written during the war. And you'll be hearing an excerpt from that in a minute. Um, I feel very fortunate to be at the ART working on this project because we happen to have an incredible president, Drew Faust, who's with us here today, who is a Civil War historian. And not only, obviously, does she have ex does she has expertise in this field, but she is such a great champion for the arts. And to say in 2008, when the economy crashed, that my boss, President Faust, said, now more than ever is the time to enter the arena of the arts, because the arts is a center for innovation, uh, new ways of creative problem solving, uh, creative problem solving, uh, and, and her passion and statement that creativity is a form of knowledge has bolstered us at ART to look how we can really partner with Harvard to redefine the role of arts as we enter the 21st century. So I'm very pleased to actually ask Drew to come to the podium, and I'm, I'm asking her a question. And my question for uh, President Faust is, how is the 150th anniversary of the Civil War being celebrated in a way perhaps differently from the 100th anniversary? So that is my question. Ladies and gentlemen, President Faust. Thank you so much, Diane, and thanks to everyone who is working so hard on this extraordinary project. It's a great privilege to, for me to be here today because this represents, the launch of this project represents things that matter so much to me from a variety of realms in my life. As Diane indicated, I believe that creativity and art are at the center of understanding. And when we think about uh, the world we face and the world that those who have come before us have faced, art gives us a very special way of coming to terms with the meaning of that experience. Uh, Diane has asked me a question about the difference between the commemoration of the 100th anniversary and the 150th anniversary of the Civil War. And I think as we uh, ponder that question, we see how history matters in the time that comes after it, and how, as we look at our own history, we define ourselves and we use that history to define ourselves. If we think back to 50 years ago in 1963, it was a time that the United States was struggling to come to terms with the issues that the Civil War had addressed, and then the nation had to a considerable degree left in abeyance for the 100 years that followed. 1963 was the height of the civil rights movement, of a time when Americans were struggling at last to bring the promise of equality and justice that had been enshrined in the Civil War Amendments, in the wonderful documents of Gettysburg Address and the Emancipation Proclamation that students will collide over this summer. And yet those promises still remained unfulfilled. And so we had this curious Civil War commemoration 
where, for example, when the plan was made for the ceremony here in Washington to observe the 100th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation, no African American was originally intended to be included in that observance. Just think, how was that possible? And so in my own childhood, growing up in that time, I could see this configuration of questions in which the history of our country and the history of the Civil War became an essential part of how we asked ourselves about our obligations in our own time. As we commemorate the 150th anniversary of the Civil War, we have new questions. We have new knowledge that has come out about the war because of the changed questions that have been asked about it. We know much more about African Americans in the war, women in the war, the experience of common soldiers. There's much greater basis in the historical record for the kind of intense, personal, meaningful questions that all of these projects are going to, to pose over the years to come. We also are a country, as others have said, coming out of 10 years of war. What has that meant to us as a nation? And how can we understand ourselves and where we are in the aftermath of those wars by understanding better the lives and experiences and insights of those who have come before 150 years ago. I can imagine no better way to address those questions than through the media that we see here before us, the questions of art that go to the heart of what it means to be human, what it means to confront the ultimate questions with which war presents you and what it means to live through that and tell those stories to those who follow us. I'm very excited about this project and I'm excited to see the works of art that it will yield and the understanding that that will give to all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Drew. Uh, I'm going to introduce Matt O'Coin. He's a Harvard grad, class of 2012, so very recently has graduated from Harvard. He's currently uh, an assistant conductor at the Metropolitan Opera in New York. And joining him is Devon Tynes, class of 2009 Harvard grad, currently getting his master's in voice at the Juilliard School. Thank you, Diane. Uh, I'm honored to be uh, a part of this project uh, and uh, too grateful for words, really. So to speak a bit about my project, for Walt Whitman, the war hospital was a dynamic space. It was a space of truth-telling and togetherness, counterintuitively. In his case, it was a place where political alliances could dissolve. He, he nursed, uh, dressed the wounds of Union and Confederate soldiers uh, indiscriminately, uh, and Whitman, the wound dresser, Whitman, the memory gatherer, is the protagonist of the opera I am composing, uh, which takes place in a war hospital as a kind of, well, purgatory or limbo, placed between the lives. No one in it is quite sure whether they'll return to this life, the one that everyone in this room happens to be in at the moment, or to pass on to another one, whatever that may be. And so everyone has something to share. Everyone has a love letter to write, or something to confess, uh, or someone to tell that they love. And I'd like to share an excerpt of a song uh, from the opera based on two of Whitman's elegies for Abraham Lincoln, when lilacs last in the dooryard bloomed, and, O oh, captain, my captain, in which Whitman asks, how shall I perfume the grave? That is, how shall I speak of the one I love. And uh, the voice of Walt Whitman will be uh, magnificently portrayed by Devon Tynes. Thank you. Of him, I 
Exalt, O shores, and ring, O bells, but I with mournful tread. Absolutely extraordinary. So I, I, I hope that you now have a little taste of what's to come. I know there are going to be media that are going to be interested in one-on-one -on -one, uh, follow-up conversations, so please check in at the table outside the theater. I also want to say that the Collision Project, which is going to be uh, happening in four theaters around the country, um, at Arena Stage, our own award-winning Voices of Now program will be collaborating as well, and I'm so pleased about that. Though we've all been working on this for almost two years in the planning on it, today is really a peak of our journey together. We know many of the clear-cut goals already, 12 artistic commissions, conferences around the country, and many new and innovative art academic programs that will invite artistry and scholarship to interconnect and feed each other, and as Dr. Knapp said, build audiences together for the theater and for universities. But we also have many questions. We enter into this, as Paul said, with a true sense of inquiry. When we partner together across theaters and universities, how much more can we achieve? How much more can we risk? How much more can we discover about ourselves? What kind of depth and breadth of work, both academic and artistic at once, is born from, what's a, from such a collaboration and communion across the country? Because ultimately this project is about a deep national exploration of the American Civil War. What it meant and what it means to each of us as Americans. How did it help shape us as a country and how does it continue to shape us today? As you 
heard, each region of the country has a distinct voice and bloodlines that take us from the origins of our country to the American Civil War to today. What's being passionately, what was being passionately fought over then, states' rights and civil rights, continues to be fought over today, from African American rights to women's rights to gay rights to gun rights, and the Voting Rights Act being heard across town at the Supreme Court as I speak this. We are in the state of continual evolution as a country, of continually becoming and striving to find the better angels of our nature as we move forward together to further and deepen our democracy, to expand the understanding of what it means and what it's meant to be an American. Now that's something powerful to explore. So join us on the journey, and thank you all very much for coming. <laughs>